This is one of those times you realize you're about to witness something for the history books. Welcome to Forecast Lab. This system in general will not break any significant records with the conventional measures like temperature, but structurally this is a real doozy and I think we will see this in textbooks and forecast studies going forward into the 2030s. So let's take a look at what we got going on. There's the surface analysis early this afternoon. Cold front from Minnesota into Nebraska, and then it's kind of stuck on the Rockies through Wyoming, through Yellowstone, and up into the Columbia River Basin. You can see up there in Washington, a very cold day. North winds, 26 degrees at Seattle at this hour with some snow flurries in the area. And in Montana, some extreme cold, minus 20s. Again, we're not talking about wind chill. Those are the actual observed temperatures. And that cold air is coming south. And it should blow through the rest of the Gulf Coast area within about 24 to 36 hours. Out ahead of it, a lot of fog, a little bit of snow here and there. And then we've got this old frontal boundary through the Great Lakes. And you can see the slightly northeast winds north of that boundary. In the southwestern U.S., not much going on, 50 degrees there at Phoenix, lots of clear skies, but out there in California, fog. In the San Joaquin and Sacramento Valleys, that's that Thule fog, very dense, very hazardous on Interstate 5, responsible for many rear-end collisions. If you go back through the old news accounts, there have been some bad ones around Bakersfield up to Hanford. And let's take a look up in Alaska, see what's happening. And there we find extreme cold. Similar to yesterday, though, temperatures close to minus 60 in Yukon, minus 51 at Fort Yukon, Alaska, and minus 56 at Watson Lake. And with that, the big 1056 millibar high from central Yukon, extending all the way down into the Fraser River Valley in British Columbia, where we've got minus 40 at Prince George. And on the other side of the Canadian Rockies, also some extreme cold. Don't see that too often in that part of Alberta. Minus 45, I guess that is Peace River or somewhere around there, and minus 30 around Edmonton. And then swinging around back to the east, Typical Hudson Bay low, but that's bringing some warm air around the north side of that system and kind of interfering a little bit with the development of cold air in the eastern Arctic region. The watches and warnings this afternoon, numerous, all the way from Montana to Florida. Most of what we have in the plains is windshield advisories. And then as we move to the east and to the Midwest, we pick up the winter storm watches and warnings. And then you move a little bit further to the east, we get into high wind advisories with that explosive development that we're expecting, cyclogenesis out there in the Great Lakes, and that'll draw a very intense southerly flow. Very active warm conveyor belt will get going in the northeastern US. Let's take a look at that upper air chart. We haven't really done this for a while. You can see that there is a blocking pattern out there in the Pacific, large ridge, a cutoff high across Siberia, and that's bringing a northerly flow through Yukon, British Columbia, and into the northwestern U.S. And we really need that upper air flow in the U.S. to be northerly or have a northerly component in order to get that polar air to move southward. You probably remember a week or two ago, we had more Arctic air up to the north, but it did not come south because the flow was fairly zonal and it had a slight southerly component. So let's take a look what happens over the next few days. That northerly flow strengthens and moves to the east a little bit, and that brings the bulk of that Arctic air southward. So we're up to Thursday and into Friday, Things progress eastward, we get a strong cutoff low in the Great Lakes area associated with that strong cyclogenesis. And eventually we return to a somewhat zonal flow, but ridging developing over the western U.S. and that will bring some rather warm temperatures to California early next week. 
and then looking at the rest of the picture, fairly zonal through midweek next week, and a couple waves moving onshore. The Pacific gets quite active. There's a strong 180 knot jet approaching the west coast. So things could get interesting as we get up to about a week from now. And that could certainly link up with some moisture and bring an atmospheric river onto the west coast. Now here's one thing that's pretty educational. This is a chart 240 hours from now. So this is the 31st of December. The flow indicated like this by the contours westerly across the U.S. and roughly the same up there in Canada. So mostly just a bunch of waves moving, moving through the flow, a couple ridges and so on. But you compare that to what we have right now, much different. A large vortex across Canada, that's that segment of the polar vortex. And despite what the news leads you to believe, that's actually not causing the weather. It does interact with some aspects of the weather, but it's actually caused by the cold air down in the lower troposphere. Most of the air mass tends to hug the surface, and that sort of leaves a vacuum in the upper levels and produces the troughing that we see out here. Many of our regular viewers have probably noticed that the thickness contours tend to approximate the mid-level height contours. And that's not really a coincidence because both of those are dependent on the low-level temperature. So that completes your little dynamics lesson. Let's head right into the forecast. I know many of you are wondering what's going to happen. So we're going to focus on this leading edge of the air mass that marks the Arctic front, and that's surging southward. And there it goes in through Oklahoma and Texas overnight and towards the Gulf. And further east, out there in the Ohio River Valley, snow showers developing, some strong frontogenetic forcing with the cold conveyor belt wrapping around the backside of the system. And on the forward side, there's the warm conveyor belt that gets going, showers, thunderstorms all the way up towards New York. And as those come together, we're gonna to see quite a winter storm in the Northeastern states. And there it is coming together. Now I did notice that the pressures were not quite as bad as what we saw yesterday. Yesterday's run had it down to I think 957 millibars. And all that I'm seeing with this storm is maybe 960. Now that's up in Canada. The record for the US was 955 millibars. And we're nowhere near that. Now on the flip side, if we go all the way back, look at that high pressure in Montana, 1067 millibars. That has never, ever been observed in the lower 48. So if that happens, that will break records. The ECMWF only going for 1060 millibars. So which one we get? Well, a lot of this is dependent on pressure reduction techniques. And that's not really in my wheelhouse. It's pretty complicated. And I think we're just going to have to watch the observed data and see if we do get near that 1067 millibars. The record was 1064. And I think that was set back in 2010. Can't remember the exact date. 2010, 2011, somewhere in there. So we'll see what happens with that. Anyway, lots of Arctic air coming south. A big chunk of it heading east into the Ohio River Valley, Pennsylvania, New York and feeding into the back of that storm there. So that's pretty impressive there. And then a rapid warm up from west to east, setting in Saturday and Sunday. So Texas will see a fast recovery. Likewise, Oklahoma, Kansas will warm up as well. And then after that, we're gonna be watching the west coast. See out here, Washington, there's gonna be some high winds there, gusts up to about 60 miles an hour in the coastal areas. And you can see those heavy snows getting going out around Vancouver. That'll shift down the coast towards Monday and Tuesday. Rains in Northern California. And we'll focus a little bit more on that on Friday's weathercast, but very likely an atmospheric river affecting some parts of the Western US. Focusing on the central U.S., let's look at what that front's doing. Low pressure near O'Neill, Nebraska. Cold front extending down towards North Platte. You can see a relatively warm 25 degrees there, contrasting with 15 further to the east. And the leading edge starting to appear in northeastern Colorado and then coming back towards 
uh, I guess whatever mountains those are, west of Chugwater and Douglas. Impressive winds at Cheyenne, gusting the 40 knots out of the west. So that's a warm wind coming from the Rockies, impinging on that front, and then up to the north, very cold conditions below zero, the zero line located about like this, all the way through the Sand Hills and back towards about Huron, and further to the north, minus 10. It's off the screen, but up there at Rapid City, minus 10 degrees with heavy snow coming down. And it's fascinating to watch this pool of Arctic air coming down. I've got the temperature map here, temperature and winds in the central plains. You can see the scale down at the bottom and the time right there. That's the valid time. So if we run that forward from this morning into the afternoon, yeah, there's that Arctic air coming down. This is about the current time. Looks like the model might be a little bit slow. But one thing that's really fascinating to me, the terrain interactions, because the Front Range, located in this area here from northwest of Denver, down towards Pueblo, Trinidad, and Albuquerque. And that cold air hugs the ground tightly. It's difficult to get that over the passes. So you're going to see it kind of get stuck and try to work through the gaps and canyons. And we run that forward. Definitely surging south through the Great Plains, but struggling to get over those mountains. And that gives you some idea of the push behind the cold air and the depth and the forcing, the mechanical forcing through the valleys and so on. And you can see that the inland areas around Breckenridge, Trinidad, Buena Vista, those are pretty warm. Those stay in the 20s and 30s, but out, let me give you the temperature. Yeah, see out there in Denver, minus 12. This is going to be about 2 a.m., minus 3 around Pueblo. And you go to the west, into the mountains, and you warm up into the 20s. A little bit paradoxical there. Meanwhile, in the plains, good surge of cold air. Oklahoma City, 35, dropping off to 4 degrees at Wichita. And there it is, surging south through the rest of the plains, and here's the passage through the Southern Plains, Texas, Oklahoma. If you're not familiar with UTC time, Zulu time, like you see right here, just subtract six hours, and that'll give you local time in Central Standard Time. So there it is. You can see Dallas getting that frontal passage at 15Z, which is 9 a.m. And temperatures have quickly dropped from the 40-degree range down into the 20s and teens. So a very cold afternoon coming up. Here's the frontal passage into the Midwest. This will affect this region mostly tomorrow morning and work from west to east. Same as in Texas and Oklahoma, very rapid transition to cold air. And this purple here, that's the zero line. So we're looking at about midnight. Let me back that up to 6 p.m. tomorrow night. Yeah, see there, Chicago already below zero zero at St. Louis, and zero all the way down towards Branson and the Fayetteville-Benton area. We go off to WXCharts.com, another great site, and we're looking at the peak wind gust here. And as that frontal system moves to the east, lots of wind. The models earlier this week, they were looking at the possibility of very high winds across a very wide area, but in the past 36 hours or so, they have pretty much settled in on 40 to 45 mile an hour gusts through much of the country. Now you can see that there are some localized spots of higher winds, especially the lee side of the lakes, the higher terrain, and so on. And wherever there's any localized mesoscale processes going on that tighten the gradient. But overall, if you're anywhere in this area here, it looks like most of the gusts will be about 40 to 45 miles an hour. A little bit different out in the northeastern U.S. Let me back this up to Friday. You can see 50 to 60 mile an hour winds up in the northeast right here in that warm conveyor belt, and that could be associated with some damaging winds, especially up in the White Mountains. And upstate New York as well, those look pretty rough. And you can see the pressure gradient very tight through this area. So that's going to be synoptically driven. So if you're in upstate New York, uh, west of Albany, north of Albany, you should take any precautions and get your stuff secured there. 
the big saving grace with this particular system is that there's not much snow south of a Denver to Chicago line. So that kind of limits the area that the Arctic air can continue to maintain itself. And when it heads south, over this relatively undisturbed terrain, it will modify rapidly. So the impacts down along the Gulf are not going to be that severe. However, it will bring some dynamically driven precipitation. Again, not quite that extensive, but with those very high winds back behind it, any snow on the ground will easily get picked up, and we could see blizzard conditions and near blizzard conditions through a large chunk of the Midwest and Northern Plains. The impacts south of that area from Kansas to Tennessee and further south will not be that extensive in terms of snow, very little precipitation expected south of that line. And here you can see how the snowfall stacks up. This should be fairly accurate at this point. You can see most of the impacts are going to be in Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio, where we could see up to a foot in some areas, and up there in northern Wisconsin as well. And then it tapers off down to the south, a lot less snow, but what we have up there, yeah, that's gonna to be tossed around by the wind, and that's gonna make some, for some extremely hazardous driving conditions. So I definitely do not advise getting on the road this holiday weekend up in this area. The winter solstice this afternoon occurring at 347 p.m. Central, and that's when the Earth is the most tilted away from the sun in the Northern Hemisphere. Also, very appreciative of Bill Johnson, our newest Patreon supporter. Thank you very much for helping to support the program. And for the rest of you, please comment, subscribe, and like. That is certainly appreciated. We're kind of going through a period of growth here. I do like to see that, and hopefully that will get us toward that goal of doing this show maybe five days a week. So that is down the road a ways. We'll see how that goes. Anyway, we'll see you back here on Friday unless we have power outages from the front. Hopefully that's not going to happen. Otherwise, yeah, we'll see you here in a few days. Take care. Bye-bye.